getting me to be able to have my screen seen. So um, sorry for the late uh, late start here. But anyway, thank you very much, everybody, for getting on the call and for being a little patient at the start here. <clears throat> I also want to thank you guys for all volunteering to be to work with our team to be the local TWIP liaison. Uh, because you guys, as we'll talk about here in a little bit, are very important to what we're trying to do. I'm going to talk for about 25 to 30 minutes. Started a little bit late, but that should still give us plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, but hopefully I'll answer some of those questions as we go along. So I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of what we're about, what, we, what we're doing, um, some expectations in terms of delivery of some materials and what we expect out of you guys and how you're important to with this process as well. Okay, <clears throat> so assuming that you guys all hear me and can see my screen fine, we'll, uh, we'll move on here with the TWIP team members. I think most of you should know this, but this is just a reiteration that uh, there are seven of us on this team. We were assembled by the CR consistency team. There's three SUs, three leads, and one journey forecaster on the team. You can see by the stars there on the graphic that we are uh, pretty well geographically distributed across the region, uh, which is good. And it also is helpful because we get different modes of severe weather uh, as, as the, pr the predominant type from you know, the Central Plains over here into the Ohio Valley as well. Okay, so why was this TWIP created? I, again, you probably are familiar with this. This is just kind of a, a review here, but it kind of sets the tone for what we're talking about. I mean. There are, and you probably wear this, significant differences in the tornado warning uh, verification across the region. You know, why is that? And there's a number of reasons. There's inconsistencies in the levels of education and experience from one person to the next. Uh, differences in, in how to use data, what type of data to use, how to use it effectively. The human element, which we'll talk about a little bit more here in, in a minute, is really important as well. That affects things. The office culture affects things, and you know there's other reasons as well. Um, an improper application of environmental data. Okay, what's important out there? You know, SPC, all kinds of stuff. What do I use? How do I use it? And, and you know, how do I determine the threat from from that information? <clears throat> And then there's philosophical differences. Um, there's differences from one human being to the next in terms of how they warn, what they warn for, and then also by storm mode, and particularly for QLCSs. And you know, there's different ideas of what we should or shouldn't do in terms of tornado warnings for mesovortices uh, with these, uh, you know, spin-ups with QLCSs, and some get deeper. And you know, what, how do we handle all that? Okay, so who are we, or who we are? Here's our mission, basically, is to develop a consistent expert level scientific approach and a continuing education program, right? It's going to continue for, for quite a while and build upon itself. And we're going to use a, what's called a five-tier training method because the idea is we want to master the process. And we'll talk about the process a few times as we go along here. I'll talk about that five-tier uh, training method in a second. All right, our expectation is that everyone will improve. All right, but we understand and realize that not everyone will be an expert. Okay, now if you take it a long road of, uh, and the beginning of the road is being a, a novice at uh, severe weather warning and tornado warnings, and the end of the road is, is, is uh, the ultimate expert. Everywhere is somewhere along that road. Nobody's ever, or obviously, no, not everybody's going to get to that expert level. And I don't know if anybody's at that expert level. I know I'm not at that level. Um, but we want everybody to be going in the same direction, okay? You're all going to be on different parts of that road, but everyone's got to improve, and collectively that's going to help out the whole reason why the TWIP is here in the first place. If everyone individually is improving and moves down the road further from where they started. And we will be here as the TWIP team to be available for local uh, cases, case review. I'll talk about this near the end of the presentation as well. You guys have a challenging case, and maybe you'd like to have another person or another entity or team look at it. You know, we're available to help out just as an extra pair of eyes and maybe a different thought or perspective as a learning tool. All right, so the five-tier strategy, the training strategy. I mean, we're, we're tasked with coming up with this uh, comprehensive training curriculum for tornadoes. Well, obviously, we know there's tons of training out there. WDTD has done good training. 
Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that have been done. There's research and what have you. And putting together such a thing is, is a daunting task. Um, and you might say, oh, great, more training. Well, some of the training that gets done is where you go in and you take a module on your own and you take a quiz and then you pass and then you check the box. Now, you might have gained some good information from that training module, which may help you for a time, or maybe not. Maybe you just check the box. But usually the help might be for a finite time period, and then you start to lose things as you don't use it very often in practice. So we want to do it so the efforts that we do here you know, have, the, have a better chance of sticking now and you know, as, as we go on in time over the next few years. So this process isn't anything terribly new, and some of you are already doing this kind of thing, but I think it's really important to what we're trying to do here, because we don't want this to be, oh, more training, let's just get it done, check the box, and then we'll be done with it, and they'll get off our backs. So the first phase here is the background materials. You know, it, it's us. It's kind of this team providing literature, modules, uh, some PowerPoint presentations, webinars, videos, and so on. Okay. Phase two now goes to or more the local office where you guys come in. It's the hands-on training. All right, it's you understanding what the individual needs are of each person, building a relationship and trust between you and that person, okay? Uh, having good one-on-one -on -one interaction and training, proctoring simulations and so on and so forth. Phase three is, again, kind of you, but also now us, again, supporting uh, what you're trying to do with various references, various tools, some, some reference sheets, some uh, data strategies. We'll talk more about that. Procedures and AWIPS that allows you to look at the data in, in good ways, and then you know, and other things along that line as well. Phase four is refresher training. And again, we all, you know, if you're a Sioux, you do refresher training each season with uh, severe weather, winter weather, or what have you. So this again is not new, but it's really important. And we've learned that. When you do uh, training, very finite training uh, modules are very short things that what, are what stick best with people, where you hit the very important parts of whatever you're trying to do. So short simulations, event reviews, uh, radar features catalog that we'll be working on will all help with this regard as well. And then finally, expert level, where now you are, you know, have received all this training, now you go out and do the training to others. You know, pass that information along. You, you learn best when you actually do the training and do research that now can be used in operations. So now it's, you know, these five phases, it's not a linear type um, uh, thing. You go from one to two to three and so on. You may be on any particular area here, and they're all kind of intertwined, and one person may be at a certain level and another person may be at another level. But again, the idea is we want this to have a last impression so it becomes innate or ingrained in the person that they know what to use, how to use it, and then put it into practice and issue a better uh, bottom line uh, process and, and warning. Okay, who we aren't, all right? We are not Big Brother. <laughs> we're not this guy here with his finger pointing at you, okay? Um, we're not here to say, hey, you guys screwed up. What the heck were you thinking? And why did you miss the tornado? Or why do you issue 10 tornado warnings and nothing verified? That's not us. That's not our job. And we'd be as guilty as anybody, OK? Uh, we understand that the uh, warning decision process is not perfect. All right, there's going to still be unwarned events. There's still going to be false alarms. We're trying to narrow that gap in those differences and kind of streamline it and provide a better process that will ultimately pro provide, again, the, the better uh, verification of when we're all done. OK, we don't know it all. Right. We are far from those who know it all. I mean, I'll be the first to admit that for sure. And we need other people. We need, we're just seven guys trying to do our jobs. And let me tell you, it could be a full-time job for all of us because we, you know, we're, we're shift workers and we're Sues and there's plenty to do here. Um, <clears throat> we need others. We need subject matter experts to help us with training the tasks. We have some of those. We will be using WDTD. Uh, we have, you know, looking down the line a little bit, somebody to facet, somebody helping us with do a poll stuff, um, some other training, of some people helping us as well. And we need your expertise too. You guys know things and have had done things at your local office that we may not be aware of that may be very important to what we're trying to do, or at least give us another idea and another perspective of how to do it. So that is where your guys' roles come in as well. And we'll talk about that here in a little bit. 
All right, so some team goals. What are we trying to do? If we boil this down into three main elements here, what we're trying to do on the TWIP, it would be these three. What influenced the process and the bottom line results the most? It's the human element, it's the behavior, the culture, and the experience levels of people. That gets into the survey here, which we'll discuss in a second. Scientific training, which we've already talked about, and data interrogation strategy. How to take the vast amount of data, and you know, there's more is coming, there's goes R slash 16, and there'll be more. How best to incorporate all that information and put it together to, you know, do what you're trying to do. Um, increased consistency across the region. We saw that inconsistencies are, 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 are definitely occurring. You'll see that in the result coming up in a second here. So we're trying to increase consistency, make things more science-based, less human-based. Inconsistency uh, is based on humans. Uh, the science you know, will help that, but it's the human application of the science which also can cause the problem as well. So we're trying to create more consistency and more confidence in training and via these, uh, these strategies to uh, look at data and assess it to help you make the intelligent decision. All right, so you all know, and I hope you all participated and filled out the meteorologist survey that we did a while back. We are in the midst of creating a complete PowerPoint presentation that has every result in it. And those results will be broken down not just by total uh, numbers, but by bargaining unit and non-bargaining unit, because you do see some differences when you split that out. I'm just going to show you a few select ones here, because it's applicable to what we're, we're trying to do here and gives you a little flavor for, for, for some of the reasons that we are here. Uh, we did have 326 responses. Now, estimating that versus how many meteorologists are in central region, we figured that's roughly 63%, which we thought was really good. Uh, for a volunteer survey here. It shows that people care about this and really want to express their opinion of what's going on. We do realize that the human element is as important or maybe even more important than science in the warning process. And again, that's where variability becomes inherent when the human element is there and that will never go away. Okay? So we're trying to understand how the human factors affect the warning decision process and any negative impacts that that will have, all right? So the idea is us to try to mitigate that to some point, all right, through the scientific, uh, robust scientific process and training the program that we're trying to develop. But based on the survey results that we have, and it wasn't, the survey wasn't all just about human factors. There was training questions and there were some other questions, office culture and all this stuff. We are going to build some recommendations based on the results we I don't know, some noise out here and out, out there. So I don't know what that's about. Um, but anyway, because, again, human element is extremely important, office culture, we need to recognize and what we can do to try to mitigate any negative effects that has so that we do have the ability to make the decisions according to our own knowledge and experiences. Yeah. You're welcome. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing somebody talking out there. I don't know if I thought everyone's on listen-only mode, but hopefully um, – it's okay. Anyway, some recommendations will come out from there. So let's look at a few of these results here. All right. Here's the first one. How many tornado warnings have you issued in the last three years? Well, almost 60% almost have issued five or fewer, and 83% have issued 10 or fewer. Now, all right, in, uh, in a given year, you, you really don't necessarily issue that many tornado warnings. And maybe in the last three years, there hasn't been that many tornadic events. So the sample size is kind of small, and maybe you would have said, how many have you issued in the last 10 years? And you probably wouldn't have any idea how many you issued in the last, last 10 years. But it does give you an idea that this is not something that we do every day. So you really do not get much chance of practice in issuing tornado warnings and all the information that goes into making that final decision of whether to issue or not to issue. Okay? So our goal here is to enhance personal confidence in doing this, again, through training and strategies. To get good at something, you've got to practice. Okay? When you don't have a chance to practice, chances are you won't get very good at it. Now, again, this is not to downplay all the really, really good people out there who are making really, really good warning decisions and putting out good warnings. You know? But there's always room for improvement with all of us. All right, next uh, survey result here, and let me, let me preface this again. I didn't mention this in the first uh, result. This is all responses, all 326. This is not broken down by bargaining versus non-bargaining uh, at this time in this presentation. 
Uh, Two-thirds agree to this statement. The tornado warning process can vary considerably from forecaster to forecaster in my office. All right, well, that's not good. There was another question that uh, dealt with it varies from office to office, and I don't show that here, but we had kind of a similar trend, that the warning process and communications intra and inter office needs to be more consistent and scientific. Again, with less of this bias of I do this when this happens versus somebody else does that when that happens and it's completely different, even though it's the same stimulus, basically, of what's being presented in the event. So our goal here is to facilitate better consistency, again, through this training and through effective strategies. All right, it's easy to say it's, it's going to be really hard to do, and again, you guys are going to help us with this. Next result, I think about verification when issuing a tornado warning. Okay, we don't want that to be, and generally this is a good result. Most folks do not think about verification here. Okay, A lot of them disagree or strongly disagree, but there certainly are some that do agree or are not sure, and it is still fair to say that verification can affect forecaster decisions. So we don't want that to be the underlying reason why something gets done. Okay, We want it to be the process. Enhance the top line process. It's kind of old leadership type principle. Work on a top line process and that will produce better bottom line results, in this case verification by default or naturally or organically, whatever you want to say. This was an interesting comment from a forecaster, I don't know who, but Ted Williams, you know, used to be a great uh, uh, baseball player way back in the day. He didn't try to hit 400, okay? He didn't worry about the bottom line of his batting average. He just tried to get a hit every at bat. You know, he tried to uh, you know, see the ball better, not swing it off speed pitches, and, and just work on his, 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 his the process of his swing, and the, the average would fall out from that. And again, same idea here. Uh, next one, I worry about repercussions from management if I don't issue a tornado warning, but a tornado occurs. Now, this interesting graph here, because this does include management responses, but if we took that out, you would see that what would fall out of the picture here would be in some of the strongly disagrees and disagrees. Okay, the management would disagree that there's repercussions if they miss something, I would think. So in a bargaining unit result only, which we do have, you see it skewed a little bit more toward the right of agreeing with this type of uh, <clears throat> statement. Um, we don't want that to be. I mean, a lot of people still don't worry about that, and that's good. Okay, there's a good office culture in place, uh, but any people that are worried about this, you know, that's not a good thing. And again, again, in terms of a region-wide type thing, this does create these discrepancies that we're trying to address here. So this result makes it more likely that the tornado warning will be issued for a fear factor type thing. So our goal is to try to, again, increase confidence in that process and to work on local culture if needed. Uh, and set accountability in place here and for folks and managers and, and you know for everyone at the local office to support decisions that are made by others that are based in good science. All right, this result here is I'm confident issuing tornado warnings for this for a supercell. As you can see, most people agree with this statement quite well. All right. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that they're verifying you know good or bad. That just means you feel confident in issuing for it. On the other hand, QLCSs look a little bit different. You have a bell curve and all the results are skewed to the left. There's much less comfort in issuing tornado warnings for QLCSs. And again, that may get back to the inherent differences in the philosophical discussion that we, I talked about in the beginning here of how to handle those type of uh, convective systems. All right. So our goal here is to under, or increase the understanding of all modes of tornado genesis the dynamics associated with that, and especially with QLCSs. So that kind of gives us an idea where to put some of our initial training efforts into uh, QLCSs as opposed to supercells. Uh, again, hit the things that people have most concern about first. All right, so here's the topics and initiatives. These are kind of the like top line type header uh, things under which there's a number of things that we're working on. I'm not going to show you every little last uh, document or one pager or, or webinar or anything like that we're going to we're working on but this kind of gives you an idea they're broken down by sections here warning operations 
uh, in, the, in your severe weather operations plan, and that may not necessarily be directly related to issuing a warning, but it sets the tone for it. Okay, the warning occurs within that environment, so we have to start with the big picture and then drill down from there. Communication, this is within an office. This is within your office and the next office. This is with our partners. This is social media communication. We have a number of recommendations that we're working on with that. Again, it facilitates a better process and operational uh, environment to facilitate a better uh, uh, warning uh, process. Radar interpretation and certain radar recommendations, looking at some of those. Again, conceptual models and, and training, data interrogation strategies, how to put this all together in the most effective way. It, it, it tends to be where you get overwhelmed by too much information, and when that happens, you tend to just look at the uh, few things that you're, you're comfort with. I always comfortable with. I use these particular things. It's my comfort zone. I don't want to know about other stuff because I think this works. Well, it may work, but there's plenty of other stuff out there that may work better. And we need to kind of make sure people aware and give them the best way to use these, these tools. And we will provide some tools as well to help with this whole process. And again, then verification and doing some event reviews and learn from events that have occurred. All right, in terms of content and material, where are we going to put all this information once we do it? All right, well, we do have two sites. We have a Google site here. That's the header of that is shown at the bottom uh, left of the slide. And then we do have a VLAB presence right now. Uh, we have, we're not sharing these sites yet with you guys because we still don't have them completely up the way we want. And we want to get some initial material delivered into those sites uh, first. But as soon as we do, we'll let you know about those right away. Besides email, these will be two sites that will be a good way to communicate with us as well. You can see down here, it's small print, but there's a discussion board here on, our, on the Google site that you can post questions by topic or just by question and we can respond there or anybody can respond. Uh, it's not just us responding. And then, you know, forums and whatever else in, in VLAB would be a way that we can uh, communicate as well besides email at this time. So a training timeline. All right, these are some things, and by, all, by no means is this a comprehensive list because I just jotted a few things down here that we want to get out this winter into early spring, okay, so we can use something for the spring season. Okay, or the earlier the better, we can get some of this out, that would be good. But there's various best practices. These aren't necessarily train, big training things, they're just best practices of things that we think will help with the whole process. Again, um, we're not waiting until we have like this gigantic mound of recommendations and training to dump it on you like a ton of bricks, okay? Then again, we don't want to just give out individual little things constantly. So every day there's a new thing from the TWIP, oh great. We want to kind of balance that and give you certain packages of information that you can get and process in a you know, realistic way, but that will really hopefully help you uh, once implemented and understood in, in your operational setting. So some best practices that we want to do here are radar things that include meso sales and abset and some other radar type of uh, uh, best practices and recommendations and some communication things, some operational things with the swap and other and, and things of that nature. And uh, our first modules of the tornado track. Again, we're, we're trying to develop a complete tornado training track or course here. And that is a daunting task because there's plenty of the stuff out there and there's plenty of new materials and everyone has studies going on and putting that all together is, is quite uh, quite the undertaking here. And that's, again, where we're going to use some SMEs to help us with that. But given that re result I showed earlier here, we're going to try to start with some of the uh, stuff that Jason Schaumann down at uh, Springfield has done. He's on our team with the three ingredients method of QLCS, the land spout things that are more common out in the Western High Plains, uh, you know, environmental things, and so on and so forth. This is not a comprehensive list here on the training track. And then as we continue through 17 and beyond, there'll be a frequent push of, of more information as we get it ready to disseminate. So looking a little bit longer term in FY18 and beyond, again, continue and try to finish up this tornado track curriculum. I don't know if finish up is really the right word because I don't think it'll ever finish because new training and new technologies and new ways to integrate uh, new data always will come along. So this whole method is and, and training process is designed to be an ongoing or a dynamic type thing, not static. 
so we will be continuing to incorporate new information with that. The third bullet here, a narrow range of personal probabilities of issuance. You might think, what the heck does that mean? Um, <clears throat> what we're trying to do is address the very reason, again, why we're here, because there's lots of it, uh, in, you know, variability from person to person in their decision-making process. And we're trying to standardize that a little bit. You can't because, again, it's, it's humans. But you're trying to do that a little bit. So we're trying to narrow the range. So let's just say, for instance, me, let's just say I don't want to miss any tornadoes. Okay? I'm willing to risk having a higher false, false alarm rate, but I just don't want to miss any tornadoes. So I'm going to issue a tornado warning when I, have, when I think there's this so-called 30% chance of a tornado from this particular storm. Well, somebody else in my office might uh, be more conservative and doesn't like to just spit out tornado warnings all the time and, and risk missing something, but you know, not issuing too many false alarms, and they are going to wait until they get a 60 to 70% chance of issuing a tornado in their mind. Now, my 30 and their 60 and 70 may be completely different because how we come up with those probabilities in the first place is, is another issue in itself. But the idea here is to try to, through science, through good science and interrogation strategies, try to narrow that gap. So maybe we're all trying to issue closer to 50 or 60 percent, not 10 percent or 90 percent or 40 percent. And that's what I try to mean, to mean there. So trying to standardize that a little bit, but you really can't ever do that. But we're just trying to do that to some degree, again, by pushing science and getting people to improve and making science-based decisions not so much influenced as much by human and office culture type environments. And then finally here, it evolved toward probabilistic warnings within FACET. Uh, that will occur. I'm pretty convinced of that. And this interesting graph here on the right here, we did have a question whether people think, pro thought probabilistic tornado warning process would be better than the current deterministic. And folks just don't know. It's the perfect bell-shaped curve here. And this is understandable. You just don't know. Some think it will. Some don't. You really don't know until you actually see how it works. Okay, so last few slides now. What is your role as the TWIP liaison? All right, again, we, our team really appreciates you guys volunteering, willing to help us. I know we haven't done a whole lot with you yet and communicated a ton. Believe me, there's been plenty going on behind the scenes. This is our so-called coming out party, I guess. And um, we just want you to know that you guys are really important to our process here. And that's why this first bullet is the first bullet. You are a key to the success. All right. You're our communications conduit to what goes on at your local office. You know, what's going on? You, again, you guys have good things there we might want to know about, and you might have concerns that we need to know about. All right? You and the Sioux, and some of your offices, this is the same person, you and the Sioux, uh, <clears throat> but the Twit liaison isn't necessarily the Sioux. You guys are the local champions and specialists, and I underline two words here, to implement what we're trying to do as a team and to support support, the team training strategies and recommendations. Now, you may not always agree with what we're doing or the recommendations that we come down with, but, and we can talk about that, okay? It's good communications between, between you guys and us guys. But we really need to support it. We need this to be a con concerted effort, uh, you know, from us to the management team, the forecasters, so you guys as our liaisons and the kind of the local champions need to kind of support this so you get better buy-in and then that kind of is contagious and others develop and to continue to uh, work on their own issues and, and to try to improve individually as well. Uh, more things for you guys is to encourage honest, non-threatening assessments of self. Look at yourselves. Have other people look at themselves. How, how did I do or how did I do well or not do well and, and how, does that, how can I improve personally? And then look at your office operations and performance. How did you do collectively? And where can you guys do better uh, if you didn't do as well uh, in an event? Or if you did really well and something really worked well, then we want to know about that. So we can maybe use that uh, going forward and sharing that with other offices. And going along with that is the second bullet, promote local studies where you're focusing on warning performance. And then lastly, the last bullet is the last bullet for a reason. It's your passion okay, and your presence that's going to help make TWIP efforts more effective now and well into the future. So again, you're there in a local office. We can't be there. You're our conduit to take everything we're doing, make it work at your level, all right, and then pass it back up to us what's working, what's not working. This isn't just top-down. This isn't forecast builder, okay? This isn't the top-down method only. This is a bottom-up method as, as well. And again, us, we all work in local offices, so we're part of the office too. 
and we need to know what's happening and your presence and your passion will really help with this. All right, so what do we need from you guys? Okay, this is your homework, so to speak. All right, each WFO, I don't think it's been done yet, but this can be created really quickly. Uh, we have a Google Drive site with all our TWIP information. We're going to share a part of it where each one of you will have your own WFO folder that you can share content and ideas with our team. Okay? And this is some of the things we'll be looking for. Radar color curves, that's another thing we're going to be coming with to provide the best color curves per store mode or, or situation here. We already have some in mind. We, we want to hear what you guys have. You guys might have some really good ones. We can't use all of them. We're going to try to come up with the best of the best list. But if you have some and you want to upload it, um, actually Rod Donovan, who's on our team, will have information about that and how to convey and, and upload those things here coming out really soon. Um, other things, AWIPS procedures or perspectives. Again, I mentioned about challenging and successful cases, whether you want advice on something or whether you just wanted to share something that you can use as a sample in our team. Oh, noise. Uh, and then robust local research. We can't look at every little last piece of information and, and, and case study necessarily because there's so much training out there that just blows our mind um, to try to put together in a coherent manner. But if you have something really good that you found that has really helped your local operations, you know, make sure that's run through the Sioux and perhaps it already has been and maybe you can upload that and we can take a look at that and see how that might uh, could possibly be incorporated in what we're doing. But the last bullet is really important. Document, document everything you're doing so we have a good idea of what's going on, why it's used, when it's used, the benefits, the drawbacks, so on and so forth. So at the very end here, summary. Weather Service has the best warning staff in the world, okay? There's your bottom line statement. But we all need to improve. We're not on the exp at the expert level at the end of that road. I don't know if we ever get to the end of that road, but we all got to be going down that road in the same direction. So we all can improve. So we need to recognize our own personal needs, our own personal biases, how it affects the warning process, how it affects others within our operations. We need to continually sharpen our own skills, okay, through the latest research, technology, and uh, willingness to be open-minded and learn from others as well. And again, here's the thing about us. You guys and us guys is the TWIP and the Twipples working together. Your feedback is needed, and you are the people that help implement and support, again, what we're doing as a team at your local level. So you guys are kind of extensions of our team, and you're really important in that sense. So that's my discussion. I'll leave it up for open discussion. have about 20 minutes. John, maybe you can open up the floor so folks can ask questions. And there are other, some other team members on on this call, and hopefully if you have questions, maybe we can answer them for you. Okay, let's go first to uh, Jim Sivaking. If uh, Jim, you can put your audio pin in, and then you can go ahead. Okay, we'll have to wait for a moment here uh, for Jim. Uh, anyone else have any questions? You can just raise your hand with the uh, GoToWebinar software or put something in the uh, questions and answer uh, section. Okay, let's, uh, let's try uh, John Gagan now from MKX. Go ahead, John. Okay, can you hear me? Sure can. Yep, I got you, John. Okay, uh, I think I know what Jim was going to ask. Uh, he and I are of crazy like mind sometimes. Uh, I think the question he was going to ask was uh, going to pertain to uh, how does the WDTD refresher training that they're going to be sending down the pipe here beginning in January, how does that fit into all of this, uh, uh, the plans that you have for, for the TWIP and, and what we can do with the office? Yeah, uh, that, that's coming from the Sioux call this morning, right? I was on that call and that discussion. Right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think Jeff Craven is kind of right there. I mean, we are already working with WTTD. We've reached out and had some good productive conversations with them. You know, Jason down at Springfield has done that and, and a couple others on, on the team. And I don't have the specific answer or, or an exact 
uh, answer to that right right now, but we will be uh, working with them with that and looking at the tornado parts of that and trying to discuss, all right, how does that fit in with what we're doing? Do we hold off on something? Do we let that go because we won't have everything by then? So I don't have probably a satisfactory answer for you, but we are definitely working with those guys because um, they have produced a lot of good stuff, obviously. And uh, we're going to see before that comes out, before there's like this mandate you have to do this or, or just recommendation that you, you should do this, uh, that our hand will be in there uh, with how that plays into the efforts that we're trying to do. Now, I don't know, Jason, if you're on or anybody else on the team wants to chime in and, and uh, add to that, comp that answer as well, please feel free to. But, John, again, I don't have the, the fin of answer there, but, yeah, we – we're well aware of that, and we're going to be uh, looking at that. So it'll be. Okay. We're not going to try to. We're not going to do it. This isn't a uh, WDTD versus TWIP thing. And okay, now we got to do not just their training, but now the TWIPs train. Oh my gosh! So it's going to be right, more of a right. concerted effort to try to work together. And they want our stuff uh, as much as we want to see their stuff. So yeah, it, it's it's a partnership. It's not a competition of who can spit out the most stuff. Right, right. And I certainly didn't want to infer that it was a competition per se, but no, we didn't. know how. Yeah, we we know how these um, uh, requirements get passed down from time to time, and I just wanted to make sure uh, our mind's eye was on it collectively, just in case uh, we get thrown a curveball. Yeah, the TWIP is interestingly, it's it's becoming popular. It's going to be coming more than, you know, it's going to go outside the central region walls, I think, in some capacity. So I think it's going to be whereby though them and us, it's, it's really going to be something that uh, uh, will be beneficial. And I think to really try to accelerate something and, and make it specifically tailored toward tornadoes. So, yeah, we're very cognizant of so much training that staff has to go through and, and John, you as a Sioux and me as a Sioux and every, all the other Sioux on here um, having to uh, try to, you know, don't get too much at one time, but make sure enough gets in. You know, the balancing act is really difficult. Right. And we don't want to add to that, uh, you know, we don't want the scales to tip over and fall down and crash down on anyone. So I don't have the exact answer, but you know, yeah. rest assured that we're going to be looking at that and working with them. Hey, this is Aaron. Um, I'll just add that the seasonal readiness training delves into a lot of areas completely unrelated to tornado warnings. Uh, specifically, there's a winter component, there's a hydro component. So uh, the comments made this morning during a Sioux call sounded as though this seasonal readiness was tornado specific. It's not. Uh, while we may have some feedback to provide them, uh, because the seasonal readiness goes way beyond the scope of just tornadoes, I don't foresee us overseeing or providing some type of filter for Central Region. Um, that's going to be more of a task that's going to come from either Central Region SSD or elsewhere. But the TWIP's not going to be delving into areas that really have nothing to do with our charter. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, I know Ed talked specifically about hydro and winter based applications in this and so we're not we're not going into that area and so while there may be a release of let's say updated tornado warning guidance uh, we're not explicitly uh, digging into all this other stuff so just keep in mind that the bigger picture here is um, what WDTD is doing is not necessarily completely related to the TWIP so just wanted to add that yeah, that's a great comment, Aaron. Yeah, a lot of it is, is not us. We're specifically just tor tor tornadoes. And if there is, when we look at that ready readiness training, if there's things in there that we're not ready to release as, as the TWIP team, then, you know, then folks should do it because, you know, it's not like we're going to be coming down with the same thing at the same time. So that's a great comment, Aaron. Okay, let's go to uh, Jeremy out in Goodland. Go ahead, Jeremy. Thanks. Um, I was wondering, right now I was fighting to be the liaison for this group. Um, just thinking about it, do you think, do you think it would be a better idea maybe if I work in tandem with someone else? Um, 
it kind of seems like I might need to, it might be better if we have an operational person along with me on this. Um, I mean, I can do it. I'm not worried about being overwhelmed by keeping up with you guys and everything, but. Uh, um. Well, we've had that discussion on our team, and, and you know, it, it varies, but my personal thoughts are, of course, at my office, we have a, a lead forecaster who helps me kind of on our science suit team be that person. Um, I I think it's personally, I mean, it could be either. It could be the Sioux. It could be a separate person. It could be one of us that's on the TWIP team. It could be the local person there as well. But I think it is good to have another person involved. First of all, it takes a little bit of uh, off of the Sioux because the Sioux has so much going on. Plus, it really allows... You know, every office has people that just love severe weather and that, and they're probably really want, might have applied even for this team and want to be a part of it. You have some passion there, and I would take advantage of that, and it helps with personal buy-in, and then, you know, these others see that from their peer. So I think it's really a uh, healthy thing to have another person, a forecaster, involved with this uh, in conjunction with the Sioux, or the Sioux, you know, uh, <clears throat> kind of empowers that other person to kind of lead that effort. Uh, you know, I think that's good. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Okay, uh, let's go to Phil up in Sioux Falls. Go ahead, Phil. Are you there, Phil? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, sure can. Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I guess my question really involves, um, I guess, two things. I'll ask one I didn't write down. The first is, um, is there any plans for, for your team to develop like a template for event reviews to help facilitate forecasters or even interns who may not be comfortable with the process of writing a review so they're not like so overwhelmed by it? Um, you know, that way I think that might help get more reviews in offices. It's something that I think certainly our office could use a little bit more of. So uh, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll start off. Anyone else can chime in. Oh, gosh, we talk about so many things. <laughs> so many email threads. Um, yeah, I think that has come up. I'm pretty sure we talked about some having some sort of standardization. So we – but – but I don't want to, at the same time, we don't want to make it whereby you have to do it this way um, because what you're doing versus what another person or office is doing may be different. It won't necessarily fit into a template. But it, on, on the other hand, it is good to be looking at the same things that, that we think are important. That you should look at this and you should look at that uh, that are predetermined in, in a template without having to kind of pigeonhole you into doing it only one way. So, yeah, we have talked about that, and that's a good idea. We can talk about that some more and, and how to provide standardization but flexibility at the same time. And does anyone else want to chime in on that one? This, like this is Aaron. Aaron. Oh, ahead, I'll, I'll just I was just going to add you know we're we have talked it uh, several times in the past about having a process where we can go in um, if assistance was requested to come in and review a case uh, but in terms of actually creating a template Phil uh, I don't know if we specifically have talked about that but that may be a concept that we can put into that process but at this point we've talked more about providing an avenue for an office to reach out to us and then we can come in uh, along with maybe some subject matter experts to help review something. But um, in reality, there, there probably should be some type of template as well. So honestly, I don't know if we've got something really formalized like that yet. Yeah, yeah, we don't have anything formalized. It is a good idea, a good thing to think about, or at least here are some things to consider putting in. Now, I mean, I'm of the personal opinion that these postmortems, you know, these don't need to be dissertations. These can just be one part of the event or, or whatever the most important part was in that particular event. So you make them where there's these gigantic, these aren't national service assessments or else you'll never get anyone to try to do them or help out locally or especially to look at themselves and, and self-assess 
and uh, and you know how that has worked in your operations. So make them, and you guys, I'm, I'm you know preaching the choir here. Make them so that it makes it important, but not a daunting task for them to be done. But that's a good point, Phil, and we'll uh, we'll take that definitely under consideration. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think flexible and but would really you know, but some standard would be helpful. My other question involved interns. Um, one thing that that we've done here is uh, I have our interns go through three or four cases with me prior to ever being allowed on radar live. Um, is there any thought of doing that? I, I guess I strongly believe that we need to that. Interns should go through additional radar cases with the local Sioux or other local expert after RAC to kind of evaluate how they do on radar and to give them some confidence and to go through different techniques that maybe goes beyond what RAC covers or to reinforce it. Um, has there been any discussion about doing that? Um, you know, when I, when I answer a question, it's maybe because I remember or don't remember something that we talked about, but I would say no. Because we don't want as a TWIP team, we don't want to, like, we're trying to help stuff out here. We don't want to try to put the kiboshes on or try to tell you guys how to do your job at your local office and what your local needs are um, in, every, in every way, more or less. I mean, yeah, we're going to come down with these things. Um, and, again, we think that interns, I'll get back to your question there, Phil. We feel that interns, or let me reverse that around, we feel that leads – or even SUs or WCMs need training and refreshers as much as the intern does. Again, those sometimes, this is a philosophical discuss, uh, statement, those who sometimes think they're the expert, found out aren't necessarily the expert at all. Um, so we think it's relevant to everyone. But I agree with what you're saying, Phil, in the fact that uh, you know the rack is and everything that just kind of gives you the go ahead to start learning more now at your local office. So I'm all for that you should, and I'm sure all the students on here do do uh, simulations with, with their interns, maybe even more to make sure they're, you know, they're, they're checked out and ready to actually handle those type of situations. But we haven't as a team yet said, you know, an intern shall go through two, three West simulations before they can do tornado warnings for supercells or QLCSs. I mean, I don't know if we want to go that deep into the weeds and I think that would be have pushback of what you guys know locally uh, and how best to handle some of your people. Okay, thanks. Okay, let's circle back to uh, Jim in uh, St. Louis. Go ahead, Jim. All right, can you hear me, please, Lord? Yes. You okay. Go ahead, my son. Okay, all right. My question is, do you think that the training is going to be distributed through the Commerce Learning Center, kind of similar in fashion that the forecast builder training was, so that it's easy for us to track it, um, and I say us, the SUS, to track it, um, the forecaster's progress? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've talked about that some. I guess I don't have the full answer with that one. I mean, I gave you a couple places that we'll put some of that, but uh, trackability is important. Um, there's definitely that certainly could well be for the, okay. Let me step back here. There's going to be certain different things we're putting out. It's not just all training and training modules and videos and what have you. I mean, there's some recommendations and one pagers that you know you guys will be responsible for making sure that everyone is looking at and doing. As far as the actual training goes and modules, I, I don't know for sure, but I would think definitely that that's something that we will do or certainly could do. It, it's just a matter of the type of training and the type of module that we produce and how feasible it is to put it on one site versus another site and actually how to deliver it. We haven't gotten down into how to deliver everything to the last detail yet because there's so much to think about before that. But the LMS obviously is a great way for, for accountability and trackability. So yeah, Jim, I would definitely think that's, that's in play. Ted, right, Ted this is Jason. Can you hear me? Yeah. Ed, yes. can you hear me? Sure. Finally got in. Yeah. Trying for about a half hour here. <laughs> I can comment more on the training plans, Jim. Um, in, in working through WDTD and Brad Grant, we do plan on having those curriculums on, on the learning center there, so 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 those can be locally tracked. 
That's great. Thank you. Well, you said it better than me, Jason, in about 20 times less words. Thank you. This okay. is Aaron. I'll just add, we should be able to mimic a lot of, like you had seen with Forecast Builder with material. So it may have something that's external to the LMS, but it's still trackable. I foresee that being a very easy component for what we could do with uh, WDTD. Okay, let's go to uh, Stephen Hodanish and uh, go ahead. Can you guys hear me? Sure can. Okay, good. Hey, when are we going to get the um, Wes's back and the WFOs? It's kind of hard to do training without the Wes. Well, that may be a question for you, more. Yeah, what, uh, you, you should have your Wes. We haven't had a Wes here in quite a while. That's that we can look at cases. We do have a Wes? Okay, we have it, but it's, it's my our, my Sue just mentioned to me it's very difficult to get cases running on it. When will that change? Well, if that's the case, then why don't you you got to have your Sue talk with me then about this is John at SSD, and okay. uh, also with the group down at WDTD that that deals with this too. Um, there shouldn't be any reason why you shouldn't be able to do most things with it or or even better talk to a near you know a nearby office and see how they're doing it okay but right now it's, it's not easy as my sue just told me it's not easy to get cases up and running on it okay well i i would say first at least start with the people down at wdtd and they can go in and and uh, clean things up and look at it okay. see what the issues are and then check with other Sues in the surrounding okay. offices or elsewhere that I mean that would be the first and if you're having still having issues or problems uh, you know then just let me know and and your name again is it's John Eyes I'm okay, the deputy John, okay. SSD chief yeah okay, John, okay. Hey, Steve, I will just add to that that we are also looking at making uh, several training simulations utilizing a displaced real-time format with GR2 Analyst. Um, okay. We understand some of the, the challenges that have existed with the West 2 bridge, um, and so as a team, we are looking at utilizing some of that functionality with uh, displaced real-time in, in GR2. So fear not, there are some other avenues for uh, case reviews, etc. Yeah, it's extremely hard to do look at cases and do research without the West being operational and easy to use. It was that way years ago, and I was able to get lots of stuff done, but in the last few years, it's just impossible to do anything. Well, also keep in mind, we are also entering an era where archive and data sizes are getting fairly large, and so there's going to be some limitations to how quickly... Uh, cases can be reviewed as well. So again, we're looking at all the different options, including not just the West 2, but uh, GR2 and uh, displaced real-time capabilities with that. Okay. The problem with GR level 2, though, I mean, I know it's nice from a pure radar application, but you know, when you want to look at near-storm environmental parameters, which I think is probably one of the most critical things with respect to tornado warnings, you know, you can't do that really easily on GR level 2. You can't look at the model data on top of the radar data, and et cetera, et cetera. So, that's something to keep in mind. Okay, thanks for letting us know. I appreciate it. Okay. And uh, let's go, uh, Mike uh, Fowl up in Des Moines. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, John, this is Mike. Um, it was kind of hit on from the last uh, person. I, and I, I stepped away during part of the uh, webinar, Ted, so sorry about that. But yeah, I was just curious what the plans were in terms of hands-on training for this convective season. Um, if there was going to be a West case that you guys were planning to produce or if those uh, the GR cases were going to be available. I just went through the GOZAR training and obviously hands-on training I think you get a lot more out of than just modules, so I was just curious to uh, when those might be available. Thanks. 
Yeah, Jason uh, Shaman down at uh, Springfield, he's taking a lead in our team with some of that training. Jason, you still on? You want to address that? Uh, hopefully I'm still on, Ted. Um, can you all hear me? You sure can. Yeah, the, the initial plan is to, to roll out that phase one foundational training, um, uh, the YouTube modules, uh, potentially some literature, those types of things. In terms of the hands-on training, to be honest with you, that may be a bit later on. Uh, that could be getting to the fall, winter, or early, uh, early next spring at the latest. Um, if we do go the GR simulation route, which we highly anticipate we will, uh, you could see some of those modules by the later summer here. But you know, we, we realize the absolute importance of the hands-on training. That's when it's ultimately when the light bulbs often go on in terms of things sinking in. So that is, that is a very high priority for us. All right, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Well, Ted, do you have any last minute thoughts or wish to share? Yeah, I just want to thank you all for uh, being on this call. Again, sorry for the late start. Um, just because you don't have any more questions now, you might think of one right after we disconnect. So don't wait for a conference call or anything. Just keep in contact with us. I mean, we're here to try to do what we can. Again, this whole TWIP thing, there's so much that we can look at and do. And there's, it's, it's, I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a very daunting task. And we're going to try to produce things as, as well as we can, as quick as we can. But, you know, you got to have patience with us. And tell your folks, tell the people there. And I can't remember, I meant, mentioned this, but we are having a, uh, you know, we're going to have a full-blown uh, webinar. I mentioned this in the email to you at least, um, in January or early February or so. So we, people at your office will be able to get a better understanding as well. But, you know, keep them informed. Tell us what we talked about today. Uh, so they kind of have an idea. We don't want this to be some mystery that uh, is going out, going on somewhere behind the scenes in some secret location. Uh, and then all of a sudden we're going to come out with all this stuff and it's like, surprise. So keep them in a the process right now. Again, you guys are very important to what we do here. And uh, tell us what we aren't doing that you want us to do and we'll consider that for sure. So really appreciate everything. Um, and we'll continue to plug away and work together and see what happens. So that's it. Thank you, Ted, and everyone on uh, TWIP, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Take care now. Bye-bye. Have a good day.